I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Seth Stevens Davidovitz, he's one of the most fascinating guys I ever interviewed. He does all this weird data analysis where he finds the secret truths about humanity from the data. Like I remember in his first book where he's talking about how this entire country had this weird fetish that we, we we speak about a little in this podcast coming up, but you only know about it because it shows up in the Google data. It's like no one ever talks about this. They just Google it. And so you find out all these secrets of human beings from all this weird kind of data. And Seth is the guy to find weird data. He, he, he's been doing it for years. He's written two books on it, now a third. The third book is called Who Makes the NBA, data-driven answers to basketball's biggest questions, plus how I created this book in 30 days using AI, which is a fascinating part of this conversation as well, because it's very interesting how AI is playing a role in, in writing. But don't think this is about basketball. This is more about an approach to data and how things we assume are often wrong. And so I'm not a basketball player. I've never... Maybe I've watched one basketball game in my life, but this was a fascinating topic for me. So Seth asked questions like, what percent of seven-foot-tall players are in the NBA? Are seven-foot-tall players actually good athletes? What determines how many basketball players a country produces? How genetic is basketball talent? What, besides genes, do NBA-playing parents pass on to their kids? What do great coaches do? So he figures out, the actual data for all these things and and makes the case for it. And I think Seth's going to write a hundred books like this. And this was just so fascinating. Plus a fascinating conversation afterwards about how to monetize anything you love. So we're, by the way, I did this whole podcast, including this intro while I'm totally really sick, but Jay kept calling me and saying, we needed a podcast. We needed a podcast. So finally, I logged in and did a podcast, but now I have to take painkillers or something, and I have brain fog, so excuse that. And enjoy this podcast. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. I'm curious if just people of the same 
as much you as you can match of the ethnic background as possible, like not only kind of religion or ethnicity or whatever, but also like where you were born as close as possible to the exact hospital. I wonder if that contributes to this feeling of, oh, I really know this person. So like- I think it's not, it's not just knowing someone. I think like there's just an outlook. If you're like a New York area Jew, you just have a certain perspective on the world. You're a little wilder than probably the average person, like a little, I, I don't know, just there's a certain, I think, way you approach life that is distinctive. And like, like different New- than- New York Jews are very different from Israelis, for instance. Yeah, no, even just like a Los Angeles Jew, I think is totally different than a New York area Jew. So yeah, and I think we're more, we're more honest than like a lot of other people. Like we're just like I think that's one of the reasons I always loved your blog. You just like say whatever pops into your head. About, I, like, I think because and I'm just, the same way. You read my writing exactly the same way. I just say like I just have no filter. <laughs> there's more maybe it's related. There's more neuroticism, I think. Or at least That's probably true uh, as well. outspoken neuroticism. Like maybe, I don't know why that is. I, I would definitely agree with that. I don't know why it is, but. Maybe I we're just getting that. that from TV. Maybe TV tells us that New Yorkers are neurotic Jews. So you kind of play the part. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think I do, but maybe that just happens. I, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. By the way, also, I want to talk about how you could start making more money doing what you do. Like, what you do is, like, really valuable. You you take all this data, like your first book, I, I, I'm I forgetting all the titles of your books. Forgive me. I I have brain fog. So for, for listeners, I currently have COVID, but I wanted to do this podcast with Seth. If we had tried to schedule this two days ago, I would not have been able to do it, but today I'm able to do it. But... um. What was the title of your first book? Everything. Everybody Wilson. lies. Everybody lies. Everybody lies. Yeah, yeah. And and you had so much interesting data and conclusions. Like I always remember that you you had all this Google search data that showed people. There was one country specifically where like everybody in this country. Um, I don't feel like calling out the country just in case they get insulted. Everyone, the men in this country, inordinately search on breastfeeding for themselves. Like that's a sexual fetish and like yeah, no yeah. other country searches. And you would never know this. Like they would never tell anybody, but they tell Google. Google is key, is the keeper of secrets. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, it, it was, it was, yeah, it, it, that was the whole part of the book that just, there's so much information that we'd never otherwise have from all the data is anonymous aggregate uh, data on Google searches on, you know, what, I'll say it, India, yeah. it's a breastfeeding fetish, but uh, lots of other information as well. You know, important topics around racism and child abuse, abortion, but yeah, also like kind of everything. Well, you know, because this is sort of topical right now. What I forget, what what was the, some data you found out about racism? Oh, it was that uh, I was just shocked by how many people make explicitly racist searches in the United States and in parts of the country, I wouldn't have thought of it. Like it wasn't just the South. It was like a lot of parts... Uh, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, uh, upstate New York. And then these areas just like perfectly predicted where, uh, almost perfectly predicted where Barack Obama underperformed when he was running and lots of other, uh, you know, aspects of American society. Wow. Kind so of a, sec- a secret racism that only appear appears on Google. Could political candidates use this data? Have they been using this data? Uh, yeah, probably not as much as they should be using it, but I, I think they're not using it right. You have to know... Yeah, I don't know. A lot of there's there's like a real art to knowing how to use data correctly, and like I, I find that most people, I always say that good data science is better than no data science, but no but uh, no data science is better than bad data science, and I think most data science is just bad data science. So it's it's kind of makes things worse. A friend of mine has a a business where he he has he he's collected all the data on every car registration and. VIN number, vehicle identification number. And also whenever you do work on your car, I guess you have to register that. So he knows when you bought your car, what kind of car it is, how often you buy new cars, and then and, and whether the car has been worked on or not. And also in aggregate, people who have X kind of car tend to upgrade to Y kind of car. Oh, and so, yeah. on. so he's able to, if he sees, oh, Seth, uh, usually buys a new Subaru every two years. He'll call all the uh, Subaru car dealers who are his clients 
and or or the one in your area and give them your name and contact info and say you should call Seth. He buys a Subaru every two years. Two years are up, and he's looking for this kind of upgrade probably. And he it actually really improves the performance of these car dealerships. I totally believe it would. Yeah. Uh, and he, yeah. He, if if you're good at predictive analytics, what that is, that's like insanely valuable. Yeah. I mean, he's selling his company for tens of millions of dollars. He's just negotiating oh, wow. the deal right now. So wow. um, he, he, he spent years collecting the data. Uh, and now your latest book, and th then you did the book that was sort of like using it for self-improvement. Like if all this data could, if you had all this data, how can you do it to make yourself better? But this third book just seems like you had this crazy idea one day and <laughs> it was fun and you decided to just go all out doing it. You went all out. And it was basically all the data you could find about basketball and interesting things you learned from it. Like you would never think that Michael Jordan in some ways of looking at it is a fairly mediocre player <laughs> or LeBron James in particular was LeBron James was much more mediocre than I thought or, or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, maybe yeah, the worst so, player out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, to be, to be clear, this is height in a height adjusted basis. So I say that all the, you know, height is such an advantage in the NBA uh, each inch doubles your chances of making the NBA and one in seven, seven footers reaches the NBA, which is just insane. There's like no other trait that gives you like such an advantage to reach the very top of a profession, I would say. And it means that if you are seven feet tall, seven, one, let alone like seven, five, you don't really have to be that good. And frequently they're not, you know, they're just tall compared to my fit. One of my favorite players, Muggsy Bogues, who is five foot three. And I think is the best height adjusted player of all time. Uh, I argue in the book. Yeah, yeah. this was a, a pure passion project. <laughs> well, well, but it's interesting though, because height is such an advantage. You're, you're a big point that you make is that height is such an advantage that they don't really have to be good athletes to be in the NBA. Yeah. If you, if you look at like the average seven footer, how, how high they jump, how fast they run, like how well they shoot. It's the numbers are so mediocre. Like, I probably shoot better than a lot of seven footers and I like barely play basketball. Uh, and then, you know, uh, how much they jump. They, uh, I, I have a horrible, I can barely get my feet off the ground, but like a, just an average high school athlete with some training could jump as high as a, an average seven footer in the NBA. Uh, and a, you know, a, a bad high school track runner would be faster than a seven footer in the NBA. They just aren't that, they don't have to be that good because they're so tall and such an advantage. Is that because like, they could just basically walk around the court and all these basically midget six foot five people, they're just yeah, towering midgets. over them and <laughs> yeah. they could just, they take the ball and just put it in the basket. Like they don't even have to jump or run or anything. Basically, I mean, yeah, some of them like Yao Ming could just kind of stand around the hoop and like dunk it without jumping. He was seven foot six. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just such a, it's a game that just plays high more than any other sport, except volleyball. Volleyball is the only other sport that, uses height like like basketball does uh but yeah it's just uh, you, you can block everyone shot you can grab all the rebounds you can score easily so but yeah. on the on the one hand basketball's you've got to have a lot of athletic like you have to have stamina like running back and forth on the court for 60 minutes that's like really hard work but i, I think a lot of this is not that I'm, I'm, they are better athletes because they train so hard but it's not necessarily, you know, if you practiced all the time to get your stamina up, to get your vertical leap up, to run faster, I think a lot of us could get approach a level of an average seven foot NBA player. Uh, but, you know, we don't do that training. So they definitely are more impressive, have better stamina. But a lot of that's from training, not from natural talent. Whereas all the six foot, six one, six two NBA players are just off the charts, like insane, ta you know, insanely fast, insanely high jumpers, insanely good free throw shooting and, you know, everything you can measure, they're incredible. So it's kind of like, I, I'm going to say it very broadly, but it's kind of like you concluded that talent in basketball is basically height, hand width, and if your dad was a basketball player also, <laughs> then you had talent in basketball. Uh, I don't know if that's all I concluded, but that was a, a big part of it. I talk about how the advantage it is to have a father as a basketball player, which frequently, which shows up most strongly in that they're just incredible free throw shooters because their dads are kind of coaching them from a very young age on the, the proper form of shooting a ball, uh, which, 
which is just really valuable to learn something like that at such a young age, like sons of NBA players do. Like, I, I wonder, I wonder which things are basket. Like, so for those listening, what, what's the, what's the name of the book again? I apologize. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Who makes anything. the NBA? Who, who makes, makes the, the NBA? NBA? And you go over everything about like, what, you know, is it nature? Is it nurture? What are, are big hands important? Is a <laughs> vertical leap important? Like all of the, these heuristics that you would think are important. Some are, some aren't. And, and you, you go over everything from the best players to the best coaches uh, and so on. I wonder which things are basketball specific as opposed to profession specific. So, so I think in all professions, if your dad was that profession, or your mom, you have an advantage. So like, for instance, if you're a football player and your dad was a, like Archie Manning had two quarterback sons who were great quarterbacks uh, in football. I think that was football, right? Peyton yeah, Manning yeah. and Eli Manning. And yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, and in, in chess, it's not always the case that a world chess champion will be the father of a world chess champion. But often, if you look at strong chess players, their dads were not as strong as them, but like like Magnus Carlsen is the strongest chess player in the world. His dad is a strong master level player. So so at an early age when Magnus was just learning, and when I guess your brain really you know forms its its strongest uh, connections between neurons, he, he was learning from his dad. So his dad was able to teach him all the basic patterns that were important to master level players. And that was Mac when Magnus was five years old. Yeah, well, uh, I actually have a chart in the book where I calculate for all kinds of different fields the advantage you, you get from having a father who was in that field. So in the NBA, if your father's in the NBA, you're 745 times more likely to make the NBA. Uh, so like that's a huge advantage. Uh, it's higher than pretty much any other sport. So football, you mentioned, it's only 60x, so like 10 times lower father advantage, in part because basketball is just way more genetic than football because of the height thing, which is really genetic. Uh, but yeah. then, yeah, yeah. But then there are other fields like president. I calculated it's 1.4 million times advantage. I mean, only based on two men, Adams and Bush, but that they, because like the odds of being president for the average person are so tiny, uh, the odds of, of, and the odds of sons of presidents have been pretty decent. Uh, it's a 1.4 times, uh, million times advantage. So way higher. And a lot of them, a lot of the fields are way higher than basketball or sports because sports say what you will about it. It's a legitimate meritocracy. Like if basically, if you're good, you're on the team. If you're not good, they cut you. Whereas something like Senator, like it's not really a meritocracy. And right. you know, even grant, I have Grammy award winner, Pulitzer prize winner, Academy award winner. They're all way higher than all the sports because you know, they just network and know all the people and who really knows who's the best actor or actress anyway. It's kind of a little bit yeah. more corrupt, I think. Uh, and reality TV star is really, really high because you can just put your kid on your show. Uh, right. like, Hulk, like Hulk Hogan just had his son on the show too, too. So like there are a lot of fields where the nepotism plays a much bigger role. Uh, whereas in basketball or, you know, or other sports, it's just genetics and then teaching them from a very young age, things like how to shoot properly. And, and it's interesting if you don't have the genetic luck, if you didn't win the genetic lottery, like with height or hand width, or we'll get the hand width in a second, uh, you, you do have to train more. You have to develop, there's talent and there's skills and you have to basically develop more and more skills to be a professional NBA player. If you don't have, if you're not born with the genetic talent. Yeah. Like, uh, Shaq, uh, Phil Jackson, uh, the coach who coached Shaquille O'Neal complained that if Shaq just worked hard, he would have won 10 straight MVPs. And someone told this quote to Shaq when he was on a podcast and you think Shaq would be extremely offended. Like, how could my coach say that? Of course I worked hard. And he's just like, yeah, that's probably true. And, uh, I didn't really want to practice that hard. And, you know, I was getting beat up so much in the game who I, I didn't want to get beat up in practice as well. He basically admitted he didn't work that hard and he still was, you know, one of the top 10 basketball players of all time because he was seven foot two and also, you know, had other good, uh, genetic qualities. You know, he, he was a horrible shooter. He never, seem to care about improving his free throw shooting. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, unfair, but I mean, it's true. And I had the same advantage in school. Like I was the shack of school. I felt everyone else was working really hard. And I was just like, yeah, math is pretty easy. Uh, I never really was working very hard. So, uh, I, you know, I, I can't really attack shack too much for not working harder. <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. So what's the story of Muggsy? Like he's five foot three. He must have had incredible skills. <laughs> Yeah, it's insane. Like, uh, it's just, we don't talk about Muggsy Bogues enough. Like, he, he should be a legend, more of a legend. He's five foot three, 14 seasons in the NBA, a starting point guard, like a good player. At five foot three, it's just insane because, like, anybody can block your shot, can, you know, grab a rebound over you. It's so nuts. You can't block anybody's shot. And yeah, he just outworked everybody, built up all his skills, and was just, like, so much better than everybody else on everything else besides height uh, to, even to compete on that level. Like if it was, let's say it was one-on-one Muggsy versus LeBron. LeBron's about like 6'10 or 6'11. I forget. 
Uh, more like six nine, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's say it's one on one. Muggsy five foot three versus LeBron six nine. What would Muggsy do? Like, what would his strategy be? <laughs> Yeah, uh, he tries to run around, I guess, LeBron. Uh, it, it, it would be tough. It would be, uh, yeah, you, you can't like, you can't like post up. I think LeBron every time would just post him up, back him down, and then just like get really close to the basket and put it up. Uh, I don't know. Bugs well, yeah, would so, have, but that's the I question. guess Bugs would have to go around and try to steal the ball. He'd have to like go around them and steal the ball every time. I think that would be the only chance he'd have. It would, he'd have to like steal it. But so, so Bugs is on a, is on a court with like, you know, 10 other LeBrons, you know, or that, you know, height and stuff. How did he survive at all? Like, can't everybody just sort of push him around and, like, take the ball from him? Yeah, he was just so much better. He was so much faster than everybody else uh, that he could, you know, yeah, it was a huge disadvantage, but he had the advantage of speed and everything else, uh, you know, seeing the court better, passing it better, that he was able to overcome that. It's insane. It's probably the most insane athletic accomplishment, like, out there to be that good at that height. It's like, it's impossible. It's like... I mean, like we haven't seen anybody else really come close to like to that. That and nobody else at five three has in, been in the NBA. Is he going to be in the Hall of Fame? I actually gave this talk re- a couple of days ago to a crowd, and there was a guy in the audience who is like a big time business executive who has a side passion of stats and basketball, and he's trying to convince the Hall of Fame to take Muggsy Bogues. Wow. So he like loved my talk. He's like, he's like, you know, cause I have some data saying that on a height adjusted basis, Muggsy Bogues just blows everyone away. And, uh, and so, so the, and apparently this guy has had success convincing the hall of fame, uh, to take other people as well. So, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, and he, he, he wants me to get on this project, uh, to try to convince, uh, the hall of fame to take Muggsy. Uh, although I may spend time, uh, implementing your money making business ideas instead of that. <laughs> well, let, let, you know, Let's talk a little more about the book and then I'll, and then how you can use these ideas because like for instance y- you determined that early draft picks are in fact usually better than late draft picks which is what should be expected and, there, and there's a way to calculate h- how much a player contributes to a win and early draft picks tend to be good contributors to wins on average and you concluded the the that hand width is most the feature most correlated out of all the features it could be any feature like what college you went to it could be iq it could be where you were born but hand width is the feature most correlated with being a good draft pick because i guess you could palm the ball but but, over performing your draft uh yeah so yeah so all else basically people with big wide hands have just uh has have historically just done way better than their draft pick suggests and sp- tiny hands uh, have done terribly. Like they've just been disastrous picks uh, because yeah, ha- like just grabbing the ball, being able to palm the ball is such an advantage in the NBA. And it seems that NBA teams for whatever reason have not fully incorporated this in their analyses of who makes a good player. You know, well, they, they, don't well, put, they don't, because players talk about this. Like you have, a, you talk about Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant wishes he had bigger hands. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just not as flashy as some of the other things. Like, for, like it just doesn't seem, could it really be as important as vertical leap or just how tall you are? But it seems like it's so, it is that important that, you know, even if you say, I think teams have been like, yeah, it's probably better to have someone with big hands. But if someone's also a real, like a really good jumper and tall, but they just happen to have small hands, we're not going to like not draft them because of that. Because could that really be that big a deal? But it seems like it really is that big a deal. What, what's more important, bigger hands or height? Uh, I think height uh, height is o- overall would be the more important variable, but it's just so well known. Like everyone knows the seven footers, like, you know, yeah. Like unless a, someone five foot eight is spectacular, everything else, you're not going to consider drafting them. Uh, whereas hand size is not quite as important, but it's just that there's a disconnect between how important people seem to think it is and how important it is. Whereas height, everyone kind of knows uh, that's a big part of basketball. It seems like with your data, you could go to a team and say, listen, I could help you with next year's draft picks and you're going to, they're all going to outperform what, what they should be doing if they're picked at that level. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. That's the most uh, lucrative form of data analysis. Cause uh, I have worked for some teams in the past. They tend to know that it, it's so fun to so many people that they just pay a lot less. Uh, it's like they, they, uh, they don't, uh, yeah. T- that that's usually not the best way to make to make money. If that's if that's my goal, I don't know if that is my goal, but 
uh, it is fun. I have worked with teams in the past, uh, just even based on my other books, just because uh, they they always need data people and uh, people, particularly people who could think kind of outside the box. Because in sports, it's very hard to uh, everyone's kind of doing the same thing, playing around with the same data, running the same models. So it's really hard to have an edge unless you have some totally different outlook. Which say what you will about me, I do always see things very differently from pretty much everybody else. So like what, what, after your first couple of books, what, what things have people called you up to consult about? Uh, everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, sports teams, helping them draft. Uh, I'm trying to think things I can talk, hedge funds, like all kinds of hedge funds. We're very interested in this data, data analysis. Uh, what, what, what do hedge funds ask you? Uh, one of them was, a, uh, I can talk about this, I won't say who, but was a big investor in Google. And uh, I worked at Google for a while and then I knew their data really well. So I could understand, like, uh, I could play around with the data in ways that are really interesting to them and understand kind of trends in ways that would have been hard to pick up otherwise. And, and then other kind of random data questions they might have, or just like, sometimes they just want to brainstorm of like, is there anything creative we can do with this weird project idea that we have or something. So like have anyone, have any of them made money because of creative use of data analysis? Uh, like I mean, for instance, looking I mean, at half satellite photos of how many cars are in a parking yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they definitely have. It's, it's always hard in, uh, I, to the extent I've worked in finance, which again, just as consultant, I've never had a full-time job there. You, you probably can relate to this. It's very easy. There's a lot of confirmation bias. It's very easy to convince yourself you did something right. <laughs> Uh, it's a little, it's hard to be very honest about, yeah. uh, you know, like whether you really had an edge or whether you just got lucky, uh, particularly if you're not making, it's a little easier, you know, some of the quant funds, they're doing so many trades that the sample size does kind of even out. But a lot of, if a fund's not making that many investments, it's really hard to know whether, uh, they just got lucky or, uh, they really knew something. Even like Warren Buffett, Nassim Talib's like it's possible Warren Buffett. There have been so many people who've tried to invest that just by pure chance, one of them is going to have a record like Warren Buffett. And it may just be he was super lucky. We don't really know for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's some evidence that he developed skills because he, he, he's been investing literally for 80 years at this point. And so yeah, probably- But if anything, if yeah. anything his big returns were before, were, were earlier in his career, I think, than- later in his career. I think now he's struggled a little more recently. So yeah, because he's so big, it's hard to beat the market when you're, you're as big as the market, like you're a market yourself. So you can't, if you, if you're the, if you're the whole market, it's hard to beat the market. I think in general, it's just so hard to beat the market. Like, yeah. Another thing I do is I give a lot of talks, like I'm kind of on the speaking circuit and, you know, I go to companies or I go to whatever, nonprofits, whatever. And then I go to a hedge fund. And the questions just get like really good. And I'm like, who is this? And then like someone will add me on LinkedIn. I'm like, who is this person? It's like, oh, he was the valedictorian of Princeton and triple majored in math and like physics and, uh, and biology kind of, or something. What kind of questions do they ask? Just, you can tell, you know, you can tell when someone's at, like really knows what they're like, yeah. just like very fast. Like they see the holes in my argument. I'm just like, sometimes I was caught by surprise. But I'm just like, I've given this talk a thousand times and everyone's just like, yeah, they're smiling along. They're just like, did you think of this, 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 and this? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Can you think of a specific instance? I'm just curious. Uh, I, 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 I can, but I don't, I don't want to like, I don't know. It might be a little confident, confidential maybe. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to say that. You, the problem with data in the hedge fund world is there's, there's a lot of data. And so with all data analysis and correct me if I'm wrong, with all data analysis, you have this huge pool of data and then you have some tools that perhaps you've developed where you basically can ask questions to the data. So you can ask like, oh, if Microsoft is down four days in a row, what are the odds it goes up on the fifth day? And is that statistically significant? And let's say you want to make a trade. You can find some statistically significant results to justify making a trade no matter what. That's the problem with a lot of this quant quant type of trading that's p hacking that's like uh you know there, there is this one paper it was written by academics that if people they, they measured the mood of twitter posts and they're like if people are angry three days earlier then the stock market's going to drop and they start a hedge fund based on this analysis and it 
it blew up. It was a disaster. It didn't work at all. I think that's like, if it, it, that doesn't even make sense. Why should anger three days earlier? Yeah. Like play out, not play out for those three days and only play out later. So that's an example. You're just testing too many things and just some of them are going to come up as statistics by chance, but the best people, the best data scientists are going to, uh, go, are, are going to, uh, you know, keep this in mind and not allow themselves to pee hack or cherry pick and, you know, pe penalize themselves for how many things they tested. It, it was very, it was very, like I did this for 10 years and or almost 10 years. And I had to really make sure with everything I tested that there was, and this might be the wrong approach, but it, it worked for me. There has to be some common sense to it. Like it can't be, oh, were people on Twitter angry three days before? It would be something like, okay, Microsoft had a really bad earnings announcement and the stock was down for four days. The past 50 times that's happened, what's happened next? Or stocks in general, when they have a bad earnings announcement, you know, and then they're down four days in a row, is there something that happens? Because then it sort of makes sense that all the weak holders would panic sell after a bad earnings announcement. And how long does that usually play out until it then has a rebound? And is that result statistically significant? Like that, something like that had some sort of common sense to it for me and, and would usually work. My instinct is to agree with you, except uh, I don't know if you read the book, The Man Who Solved the Market about Jim Simons and Renaissance yeah. Technology. Yeah. And it basically was the exact opposite approach where they built machine learning models. And they, it was a total black box. They had no idea why it worked. They just, and, and it, it was terrifying. They were terrified because they're like, uh, we're just making these predictions based on no understanding of why the co these correlations are exist. Uh, but they were, they've been printing money for decades with this approach. Yeah. I, and he, he actually wanted to offer me a job once we were in communication and, um, I was all set to go for an interview that looked like a formality. And then he said, he asked me, what did you do your PhD on? And I'm like, oh, I went to graduate school, but I was thrown out. I didn't get the PhD. <laughs> and he's like, "Ugh, we only hire people with PhDs. We can't, really? we can't hire you. <laughs> Interesting. That's, so, that's so weird. That's a, I would think he would be less, uh, less like by the book. No, that, that was his rule, like PhD or nothing. And cause I, had, cause I had written a book about data analysis basically in the financial world. And, uh, uh, you know, that's how we started talking and it, it was interesting, but it was like, I had another strategy where, you know, Canada and the U S are basically the same country. So the markets should trade the same. And so if, if Canada though went up a few days in a row and the U S went down a few days in a row, you could go long one and short the other. And it usually, it was a very, very safe strategy. It didn't make a huge amount of money, but it was extremely safe. But Canada is also correlated with Australia, like these other ex British empire, uh, economies. And, but then you have to look, Australia is correlated with some Asian economies. So you always have to see you know, all of the correlations and how they're working together. And, and there was interesting data there that, that gave me a good system for a couple of years. I mean, yeah, most of the, most of these winning strategies work, as you said, for a couple of years, they just work for a period of time and then the market figures it out. Uh, yeah. The arbitrage always goes away on, on all these things, but the arbitrage can't go away with basketball. People just have to grow, go, go, grow bigger or have bigger hands or <laughs> have more dads who were in basketball. What are some other features that, uh, that surprised you that the data uncovered? Well, this one is kind of a little subtle, but, uh, you know, when you're uh, tested to be an NBA player, you have a standing jump, like you don't get a running head start and then you have a running head start jump. And it turns out that undervalued players in the draft, like you want to draft players who have a good, a much better standing jump than the running head start. Cause I think a, a big problem that NBA teams have is they get too attracted to shiny qualities. So someone could just like jump with a running head start, like really, really high. It's like, oh my God, that's so impressive. But a lot of the game of basketball, you don't really get a running head start. You're just kind of in place or, you know, right. half a step. So those players I think consistently undervalued, whereas the great leap, the people who need a running head start to leap are like, they tend to underperform uh, their, their draft pick. And another one that's really interesting is if someone's really ranked highly in high school, and then they fall in the draft, uh, you should just draft them anyway, 
It's like if someone was like in high school, everyone's like, yeah, this player is like a can't miss. He's the 10th best player in the country. And then all of a sudden he plays in college for a couple of years and everyone decides, ah, maybe he's not that good. He's still probably that good. So like, it's kind of like you should go with your first instinct. Uh, there's that phenomenon in basketball too, where these players who are huge, you know, big time recruits in high school and then they fall to the second round or whatever, tend to be really good, best, like really good bets. Why do they not do good in college? Uh, I, it could be just random thing. Maybe, yeah, we don't know for sure. Maybe it was just a bad system. Could be that could be the reason that it was just a bad fit or something, and they don't do as well as people are expecting. And everyone's like, "Oh, well, maybe they suck." Well, no, that they, they they still are as good as everyone originally thought. Uh, well, one interesting thing you had was that people who didn't go to college tend to do be, be better NBA players than people who went to college. And you yeah, think that, was, that college gives you four years of intense training. Um, like forget about the education part, just four years of intense coaching um, that would help. But wh where do the non-college players, are they just like going straight from high school or wh what's their story? Yes. Well, that, that used to, it used to be, they go straight from high school. It's not allowed anymore because uh, they banned straight from high school, but when they were going straight from high school, there's this huge inefficiency that they were just massively undervalued. It's kind of similar to uh, the Teal fellowship, right? Where he like gets all these people who are the most talented people in the world to just skip college and they're just massively more successful. Uh, I think, yeah, it, it, maybe it's like also inside information. If you're willing to go straight to the NBA instead of go to college, you're probably better than people realize because you maybe know more about yourself than even they know. Uh, I, that, that could be part of it. But that, for years, that was like a massive inefficiency. Just take players who weren't going to college. And so so I'm trying to think there was some other piece of data. Oh, what was the deal with coaches? So, so do you think there are so, is such a thing as a good coach? And, and yeah, your, think, your, your point in there, though, was a good coach is someone who encourages, who is able to, has the ability to get players to pass more frequently between each other. But does that result in more wins? Yeah, oh, I'm, yeah, like 100%. I'm convinced that coaches are really important. There are a lot of statisticians who have looked at it very different ways, and they're all like NBA coaches are really important. I think the thing about the NBA is there's an incentive problem where uh, basically players get rewarded for just scoring a lot of points. They get yeah. paid more and they get more fans. So like players have an incentive to just take a ton of shots, particularly shots near the end of the game. Like if you have a chance of being a hero, like that's so valuable. And if you miss a shot, everyone just kind of forgets. Uh, so, it, but that's bad for the team because you, it would be better if they pass for a better percentage shot. So the great coaches are able to get players to kind of overcome their incentives and pass the ball more than they naturally want to, uh, which is, yeah, that's, that's, I think the secret of, of coaching in the NBA and why it's just insanely valuable. Like the great coaches, I think, add about as much to a team as a great player. So. Yeah. You mentioned um, one coach who made the players dine together more frequently and just spend more time together. So they would bond more instead of having their own little, you know, little islands for themselves. Yeah, it's funny because like you think that was Greg Popovich of the Spurs, who's kind of a legendarily good coach. And you'd think that like what does a great coach do? You'd imagine them like just diagramming plays all the time and just like really being in their own head and being basketball geniuses. And it seems like a big part of his secret is just the social aspects of the game, basically getting the players to, to like each other uh, enough that they're willing to sacrifice some of their own, uh, you know, some of their own monetary uh, rewards for the good of the team. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's 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 a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 
NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25. NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, Download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious, like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. What made you want to do this book? The thing we haven't talked about is I wrote this book in 30 days uh, using oh, yeah. AI tools. So I became obsessed with AI. Uh, I, am, I am completely obsessed with AI. I'm just like, this is changing everything. And I started playing around with these tools, this tool Code Interpreter uh, from ChatGBT, where you just like, it just does all your data analysis for you. It's so insane. It's like the most insane product I've ever seen in my life. Do you like, feed it the data or does it yeah, have the feed, data? No, you feed it the data and then you just talk to it and it does everything you ask. It runs all the code. It creates your charts, your graphs, your new data sets, everything you want. It just does it. It's so insane. It was like the most mind blowing thing I've ever seen. So what data do you feed it? And you feed it in the format of like Excel? A CSV, yeah. You uh -huh. just feed, feed it like these are all the basketball players. Uh, yeah, this is their, you know, all the physical, their physical stats, their college stats, their pro stats, where they're from. And then like, yeah. And then you just talk to it. You're like, 
uh, you know, add a variable of what continent they're from. And it just knows every country, what continent that's in. So it'll, you know, make France, Europe and China, Asia and Canada, North America or whatever. And it's just like so insane. So basically things that used to take me four months now took me about four hours. So I'm just like, wow, if, if I could do things that quick, then I could write a book really, really fast. And I tried to calculate how fast I could write a book. And I concluded I could write like a good book in 30 days, which everyone told me was totally insane. I wouldn't be able to do it, but that kind of like that, that was fun too. Cause it was like, Oh, you know, people don't think I can do this. Well, I, I'm going to show them that I can write a good book in 30 days. So that was motivation. And then I'm obsessed with basketball. So I'm like, well, might as well write about basketball. Cause uh, it's such a passion of mine. So uh, it was, it was a combination of, it was mostly due to AI that I, I just wanted to like play around with these tools. And, and it's great. Cause the, the AI, it's not like it wrote the book, right? It yeah, was yeah. like, it was like an assistant. It, it basically allowed you to crunch the data a hundred times faster or 700 times faster than you normally could. Well, and then all the art. So I've never had art in anything uh, I've done. Cause I like, you asked that's me to hard. draw. It takes a long time. It's not just it takes a long time. I have zero talent. Like you said, draw a horse. Like I couldn't draw anything like that at all resembled a horse, but now I have like art that I think is people have been telling me like, oh, wow, Seth, your art is so beautiful. And I'm like, you know, but I didn't do any of that. I just told mid journey or Dali, like make, you know, make a, I have a section on genetics. So I'm like, you know, it'd be fun for that. Make a piece of DNA, like playing basketball. And then like they have a piece of DNA playing basketball. It's like all these things. I'm like, wow, you know, that's super cool. And like, it kind of, it's kind of fun. Cause like one of the, like, I think there is a creative artistic person inside me. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. But I can't, I can't express it because I have no talent like to draw, but then like I can express it now because Dolly or mid journey can just draw my ideas like, Oh, DNA playing basketball or, you know, whatever idea I have. I mean, when ChatGPT first came out, I did a little experiment. I wanted to see if in an afternoon I could have it write a book. So uh, I wanted to learn more about like neuroscience. So I just started with like random prompts, like what makes someone smarter in terms of neuroscience? And then it would mention all these neurochemicals. And, and then I would say like, okay, well, what foods contain or boost these neurochemicals and it would list some foods and then say, okay, come up with five recipes that use all of these foods. And it would come up with these recipes and format them just like in a cookbook. And yeah, you could have pictures of, of the food. And it's, it's, I think it's a real great thing where the hype equals the reality. Like AI actually is immediately improving the efficiency of the entire economy for, for millions and millions of people right now. Yeah, it's, I totally agree. I mean, like, even you just see the uses. So if you go to mid journey, like, uh, if you use mid journey, it's on discord. Uh, that's the art product. Uh, you, you give it a prompt. Like, you know, I, I have one, I, I wanted to talk about, you know, I have this theory that the best potential basketball player is probably working as a rice farmer in India right now. Cause like, what's, what's the chances that the best basketball player, LeBron James or something happens to be born in the United States. Like it's more likely that there's someone out in India or like, you know, in, in the United States, a tiny part of the population that just never grew enough because of bad nutrition or never developed their skills. So I'm like, it'd be fun to draw LeBron James as a rice farmer in India. So I just tell mid journey, like draw right LeBron James as a rice farm in India. And it looks exactly like LeBron James as a rice farm in India. It's wild. But then when you're on mid journey, you see what everyone else is asking for. And it's just like, yeah, like one of the big use cases is coloring books. For example, people are like, I'm making a coloring book, make like a elephant, like coloring coloring or whatever. And it's so, it's perfect. Like there's no use for a human to create a coloring book anymore. Uh, yeah. Like obviously a, there, you just do AI mid journey or Dolly and you have your, your whole coloring book. You do, I mean that you could do in like a day yeah. you come up with a coloring book or something. So yeah, it's like it, the, yeah, I totally agree with you. The hype. And the weird thing is AI right now is the worst it's ever going to be. So it's only going to get better from here. Like this is the worst version of AI there. It's, you know, it's only going to go, uh, you know, improve, uh, and it's still already revolutionary. So like, yeah, it, how, I, I how wonder if there's a plateau get? though. Like I wonder if there's the huge leap and then now improvements 
may be significant, but it might not be as noticeable. Like when you buy a MacBook Air now, as opposed to two years ago, it's much better than the MacBook Air two years ago, but you can't really tell. Like, it's not like it used to be 10, 15 years ago. There might be a plateau, but like, I think the end game is just like an infinitely smart person who can, uh, an infinitely smart machine who can do everything like in no time. Yeah. So like, I think we eventually will get there. So we, it might be like the curve, if it's been growing exponentially, it may like stop and then go like start growing exponentially again in 10 or 15 years. Uh, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I think the end game, as long as it doesn't kill us all is just like a perfect intelligence. Well, what, what other, what other data things can you feed it? What else have you played around with? Well, I mean, uh, the last 30 days I've been working nonstop on my book because I was trying to write a book in 30 days, which is not easy. So Wait, did you have a publisher stuff. publish it in 30 days no, no, or did you no, self-publish? No, no. Oh, I couldn't. I self-published. I couldn't, okay. uh, I yeah. couldn't convince any publisher to, uh, yeah, yeah. No, you have to, to self-publish this project. This. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> take this but, project. But now you day. realize now that you, now you've discovered the joys of self-publishing. So now you can write your next 50 books. It's so much fun. It's also like, uh, I just kind of like, uh, you, I don't know if you can relate to this. I just like the challenge of like being outside the system. It's like more fun. It's like, it, you feel like you're a rebel a little bit. And it's like, it. usually I hate self-promotion, but I've been really enjoying self-promotion for this book because it feels like I'm a little bit breaking the rules and like trying to convince people to have have me on their show, even though I'm not like an official Harper Collins author anymore. I'm just like a self-published author. It's really fun. My best-selling books are self-published. I about 50 per, so I have over 20 books. About 50% are mainstream published like Harper Collins and so on and 50% are self-published. My best-selling books by far are self-published. And it's because you can market it better because it's like it's still fresh in your head. You probably you don't have to wait a year and a half after you wrote it for it to be published. Like you just wrote it and now it's published. So you could still talk, you have the energy to talk about it. You could also play around with pricing. You could do deals with email lists and marketing to, to like, you could market it yourself. You, I can't market my Harper Collins books. Like I can't pay for ads on Amazon because they only accept the ads from the publisher. So whereas self-published books, you can. I totally agree with you. And for whatever reason, it's just been really, really fun. It's like, it feels like, like, I, again, I hate self-promoting. I've always hated marketing. I've, it's always felt like gimmicky or whatever, but the challenge of this has been like, I've just been leaning into it. Like, uh, someone told me the book was, they couldn't get a paperback copy of, of my book. And I'm like, you know, I'm sure that was just like an error of Amazon or whatever, but I'm like, it, it'll be really fun to make this seem like my book is in so such high demand that it's sold out everywhere. So I started like blasting it on all the social channels that, you know, the book book is, sold out due to high demand or whatever. I've just been having so much fun. Like that's like a classic marketing trick, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to like, which I've never done before. I've always found it uh, gimmicky, but for some reason, I think the self publishing has just like unleashed. Uh, well, cause the it's more of your baby. It. And, it's and more my baby. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that, yeah, it's, it's more my baby. And I feel like I don't, I, I'm not responsible to anybody. Like if they're, I don't, nobody's watching me to be like, you're not allowed to say that or you, whatever. It's just like, it's all me. And I just love that. So here's a data thing, like, and, and a friend of mine did this data analysis in 2014 about pub, mainstream published books versus self-published books. But first off, he did it in 2014, so that's nine years ago. I don't know if the data is different. Second, or maybe it was like 2016. Second, I, I don't know if you ever saw the TV show uh, Silo. It's uh, Hugh Howey did this. So he, he wrote the book Wool, which became the TV series, excellent TV series Silo. But he his analysis years ago concluded that on average, self-published books have a higher ranking than mainstream published books. And on average, he had some other conclusions that were, you would think would be the reverse, but he concluded that self-publishing was better. I'm forgetting all the data now. But it might be. That said, can you actually get like rich, rich for books? It seems, I guess you can, really. Let's take mainstream published books. Let's say you yeah. get a huge advance, all right? Uh, I don't know. What's a huge advance these days? Like you, okay. A million dollars, a few people still get and, and, and so on. I had a good advance on my last mainstream published book, but the advance is spread out over many years. So it doesn't right. really feel like it has that big of an impact to your income in any one year. And then, and then the, the agent takes out 
20%, and then the IRS takes out about 50 to 60%. And so, and then you get these payments like once every year and a half, or you know, you get three or four payments. It just doesn't feel like you're making any money on a mainstream published book, even if you have a huge advance. I know, I know you're not getting rich from a mainstream published book. I'm saying, can you get rich from a self published? I mean, I guess you can. Like, you know, you can get rich from books. J.K. Rowling is a billionaire or whatever. But I'm saying, yeah. like, from my, are, that's, experience, uh, that's from my experience, from my experience, yeah, from my experience, like everything I've done creatively, even when I thought I was making a lot of money, because I had just been a grad student, I'm like, by my standards, compared to my thirty thousand dollars stipend, this is a lot of money. When a business, call, like a hedge fund, called me up and they wanted to help, like me to, to work for them, I'm like, oh, that's another league compared to a creative pursuit. But yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm. I I I I, I mean, it's no, also we, obviously it's obviously a power law. So like. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Like so so John Grisham, JK Rowling, they're they're definitely outliers. And self-publishing is hard, but I just think let, let's put it this way. I think you're more likely to make some money from a self-published book than a mainstream published book. No, because, I agree some money, but right. it's even hard. Like who makes the MBA? Like although I've been lying and claiming that it's like you know, nobody can get it in the bookstore cuz it's a, it's so much to ban. You know, I'm refreshing the royalties on like Amazon. And it's not that much, uh, you know, and no, I'm getting you, five bucks. But you can do book. deals though. Like when, when I had my book, choose yourself, come out, some guy called me and said, Hey, I have this huge email list. This guy had like a million people on his email list. If write a few extra chapters and make it hardcover. Cause at that time, Amazon was doing paperback and Kindle and audiobook, but not hardcover, make it hardcover, uh, uh, write a few more chapters. that's just for people on my list and include like your stock predictions. And I will sell 20,000 copies of this for $20 in two weeks and split it with you. And, and he did? And he did. Wow. He, said, he sent me a check literally for $200,000 two weeks later. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that is. And that, at that time, that was the most I had ever made from books. A book. And that was because I did this deal. Like you can do, you, you can do deals that right. publishers can't do. Interesting. It's just another thing with books. I feel like, so I love books. So if someone like, anytime I see like, you know, someone tweets, hey, hey this book was good. I just order it. It's, yeah, you know, 15 bucks. It's like, what do I care? You know, 15 bucks, whatever. I'm like, I, I love books. I, I'll learn something. I'll learn a few things. You know, I, I buy a ton of books. But I feel like the average person just doesn't like books. That like, I mean, another thing I'm seeing, like I'll tweet, I'll tweet a I had one tweet when I was promoting my book before it came out, it got 1.1 million views. And then like five people bought my book off of that tweet, like the, which is a terrible ratio rate. So what am I doing wrong there? Like, is that, well, am I doing Because your people aren't going from Twitter to Amazon, but what they will do is they'll go from Twitter to Substack. So you could do a thread. Here are, five things about the NBA you definitely did not know. And then you let you have a new, you reply to that tweet and you have the five things and each in a new, new reply. And then you, at the end you say, if you like this thread, I thought it was interesting. I have a lot more information like this. Subscribe to my newsletter on Substack and you link to that. And then you have, then you're bringing your audience onto your own platform and let it, instead okay. of you're getting to so know I need, your I, audience. I need a Substack. I need a Substack first. Yeah. Like you need a way to get to know your audience. Like right, right now, they're just these amorphous Twitter followers who love your stuff, but you just don't know anything about them. So you need to kind of build a community and you can do no, that. It's not, it's not saying they, no, sometimes I'll also see like, you see the Twitter statistics. Like a lot of people just like click on your profile when something goes viral. They're like, who is this person? <laughs> they probably just yeah. followed me like five years ago and they totally forgot who I was. And I have a yeah. tweet going viral. So they're like, oh. Or, or someone shared it. So they, so they, yeah, yeah. their friend shared it, but they don't follow right. you, but they, they follow their friend who shared it. Right. But if you could get people onto your newsletter, then you could communicate directly to them through your newsletter and a higher percentage of newsletter readers will buy your book than Twitter followers. Twitter followers, you're lucky if you're going to get, you know, one tenth of 1% to do anything, but right. they will go from digital thing to digital thing. Like if you have a free newsletter, they'll subscribe to that. So like, so yeah, so because you said you're going to offer me tips to make more money. Uh, so like, do you think doubling down on like creative stuff 
Because I feel like I should, I love doing it. I did this one month project just because I'm like, this. I'm not like I'm going to get rich off an MBA book. I'm just like, I saved a lot of money. I don't really need to think about money for a bit. For a while, I'm just going to like have fun for a month and fool around with NBA data. And and like, you know, it was, it was pure joy. It was like the month of my life, the highlight of my life, I'd say up to this point. That's great. But like, yeah, but I'm kind of like, I think the creative thing is kind of like, a, I don't know. From, from what I found, like I said, anytime like a business reaches out to me, I'm like, that's where they really have the money and the creative stuff is hard, but. But don't, don't, don't separate out creativity from business. Like right. you're a real creative data analyst. Like you find things like people in India have fetishes about breastfeeding. Yeah. I've and, that one I've never been able to monetize. Maybe I should be like, yeah, there should be like some, a breastfeeding porn company, especially in India. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is look at my friend who has this car data and right. like he told me if, if, if you have a Subaru, I'll, I'll, the first question I'll ask you is what's the name of your pet? Like everybody who has a Subaru has a pet. So he right. has like all this data about people, like he's obsessed with cars. So he has all this right, data right. about people based on their cars. So yeah. you know how to analyze data and you're very creative at it. Like this is like an art form too. As you right. said, there's bad data analysis and there's good data analysis. You, there's some types of data analysis that will make money and some that won't. So maybe finding things out about porn might not make money, but uh, there are areas and, and stock market might be too crowded to make money, right. but there are areas like, like, again, my, my friend's doing it with cars, car dealerships, by the way, he's only doing it with new car, car dealerships. He's not even doing it with used car dealerships, like new car dealerships was enough. So this is like this brand new field. It's not a brand new field, but it is a brand new field now because of AI making things so much faster and easier that there's kind of this wide open field where you could find creative stuff that is potential to make money. For instance, insurance, there's a lot of statistics in insurance, but I bet you it's not really using the latest sophisticated data analysis techniques or even selling insurance also could be related to that. I know, but just like thinking of that makes me want to like shoot myself in the face with a shotgun, like uh, insurance markets. Like another problem I have is I just, if I'm not interested in something, it's very hard for me to do it. I, I know and the like, feeling. Yeah. yeah. I, and like I, I've always, I've always my entire career, like I do something completely impractical and then I'm like, this isn't working. So I, I major in philosophy, which is like the least practical. I was in Stanford, the hardest Silicon Valley ever was studying computer science. My friend in my dorm was like the eighth employee of Facebook. And I was like reading Nietzsche books. <laughs> like, like, it was insane. Like there were four kids in the class. Like it was not nuts. Did but you get okay, angry at the, at the tech kids who then got rich? No, 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 no. Uh, I'm not going to admit. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I probably did. But, uh, so then I'm like, okay, well, this is not going anywhere. Like I've, I've having again, I'm having this, I, I loved it. I was smoking a ton of pot. Like I was just like really enjoying my life. But I'm like, you can't just read Nietzsche the rest of your life. It's like, you have to do something practical. And then I'm, I got an economics PhD, like the, the total, you know, from zero practicality, to like a hundred practicality. And like, I was all on the path. I was writing papers on like the equivalent of insurance markets. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm, you know, and the professors were like, you're, you're, you know, liked me. I was on the path towards like a good academic job, a safe academic job. And then I found Google trends data and like breastfeeding porn. And I'm just like, I, I got to look at this. <laughs> like, and I just stopped completely all the practicality. And I'm just like, and then I, I like, so I always like, I'm always on the verge of practicality. And then it's like, Philosophy, porn, uh, NBA analysis. Yeah. So what do you, know, what do you make, James? I, I, I find your analyses of these situations interesting. It, it, you know, I have the same problem, right? Like, so in 2001, 2002, when the dot-com boom was busted, a lot, like a lot of my friends who were in the tech business in New York, they all picked up and moved to Silicon Valley. And literally they all became billionaires. They're all billionaires now. And I could have done that too but I didn't want to do it because I wanted to write a novel. I wanted to right. write books. I wanted to, um, I mean, I built other companies. I sold them. I did okay. I was a, a hedge fund manager for a while, but I always asked myself, what if I had just, it's, it's a better life anyway in California. It's better weather. It's, it's everybody I knew moved there. What if I had just done that and focused on money just a little bit more? Maybe I'd have like a billion dollars, but then I wouldn't have done I mean, I did stand-up comedy for six or seven years. 
I've written all these books. I've, I, you know, have some degree of notoriety. I have this podcast, which I love doing. So I wouldn't have, you only have one life. So yeah. And I, I kind of feel like if I spent 30 days just doing what I love, like no, a bill, that's even hard for a billionaire to do, right. To like ha- find a passion project like that, that they're so obsessed with that. Like who cares at that point? If but I would say their passion projects are things that would like, like Elon Musk is doing his passion project. He wants right. to go to Mars he figured out from the ground up how rockets work. Right. And he put it all together and made billions of dollars at it. Like he has a passion for that. So I do think a lot of billionaires ha- are passionate about businessy things. Well, that, and- yeah, that's like, that's like winning the lottery if your passion also has to be like connects with a get rich yeah. thing. So like when I was in high school, I was obsessed with fantasy sports. Like I've just always been obsessed with sports. That's the who makes the NBA book. And like, my dad is like, I, I was like number, like I was like winning all these national competitions and fantasy sports, even though I was like, everyone else was like a grown person. And I was just like a little kid. Uh, and my dad's like, this is very impressive. Like, it's great that you're so passionate about it, but like, can't you just devote all this time and energy to the stock market? Well, cause like he, he gave you bad advice. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Because, okay. okay. If you, my podcast, I've had uh, on as a guest a couple of times, Matt Barry, who, um, he was a Hollywood screenwriter. He wrote right. like one of the Crocodile Dundee movies. He's written a whole bunch of things. He was making a great living out there and he hated it. He was, right. he hated it. He, he had the same expression. I felt like I was going to shoot myself in the face and, and he loved fantasy sports. So he quit all the Hollywood stuff and he got divorced. Like his whole life changed. He lived in a, he moved out of his fancy Hollywood house, I guess, and moved into a small apartment he started writing articles for a blog about fantasy sports for a hundred dollars an article. And because he was a good writer, cause he'd been a professional writer, his writing started getting noticed. And there's a lot of fantasy sports fans out there. So he created his own site and it got bigger and bigger. He sold it to ESPN and now he's the anchor for fantasy sports uh, on ESPN. Like when I walk in the street with him, everyone says, Oh, thanks for the, those picks. I won my league last Sunday or whatever. Like he's famous guy, ESPN made money, makes a great living and all from fantasy sports because he, because he single mindedly pursued the profession and figured out how to make money off of it. He built this platform and, and then he sold it. And yeah, but that's another danger in picking a career, right? Is there's all this selection bias. So the ones who tried that and didn't get anywhere aren't going to be on your podcast. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And so you don't so know. So you don't know. Yeah, I don't know what the odds are. How, what percent of people who quit a lucrative job to, to follow their passion, like it turned into anything? Well, one thing you know, one thing we know for sure is that the percentage of people who do that is higher now than it was 30 years ago because of right. the internet. So like, right. I, you know, my listeners know I'm like uh, obsessed with chess right now. And one of the things that really intrigued me back in 2020, when we were all kind of locked in for COVID in 2020 and 2021, is that chess players who weren't necessarily the best players in the world, in fact, some of them are not very good at all, started using YouTube and Twitch to analyze games or stream their games live while they were playing the games. And this became a thing. And so some of these people have like hundreds of thousands or even millions of followers and are making millions a month on chess, a, a, an activity that never made anyone money ever in history, but now is making even bad players a living and not just a few, but like quite a few. Uh, and it actually is not as big now as it was in 2021 when we were all locked in. But, uh, so that, that kind of amazed me that because of all these tools available to us and getting more and more available to us, you could basically do anything. And there's probably some way to make a living at it. Well, no. I, I just think the question is the odds. So even even chess, what percent of chess people who twitch are making a good living on? It? It's probably pretty tiny. I think the it's hard to say because there's selection bias, but there's also if you weren't succeeding, like how fast did you give up? So right. a lot of the people who just stuck with it, who who started maybe their Twitch streams in 2016 and had 50 followers, then 60, then 80, and they stuck with it, and then the pandemic came, and the TV show The Queen's Gambit came out. And then suddenly it spiked and, and they had developed, they spent years developing their personalities on Twitch and YouTube and so on. So they got a huge fan base. Basically all of the, all of the people who stuck with it succeeded. We just don't know how many people kind of 
gave up before their magic time, or maybe they gave up because they didn't have a good personality or, or they didn't enjoy it for whatever reason. So it's hard to say, but I do think the odds are much higher now than they've ever been before that you could take anything. And like, for instance, if you did a newsletter about quirky data stuff and you did this, you know, once a week or once a month, you would pr quickly get a hundred thousand readers and you could monetize that. You could have ads in your newsletter and it would make you a living for the rest of your life. Like I know plenty of people. Who, well, news, sub stackers, some of them are killing it right now. That is like, yeah. yeah. And that's just persistence, consistency, and having good information. And you have the good information. I would, I would try to think not just for basketball, but for like any field, like, right. you know, the data, the, the quirky data of the week and just put it out there. And I bet you, you'd get like quite like, I know one guy, um, uh, Joseph Pompliano, uh, who has a newsletter. Oh, yeah, I, called, I think I follow him on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, think I follow a, him on Twitter. He has a newsletter called huddle up and he combines, he was an ex Morgan Stanley bond trader. He combines, uh, business with, with sports. So he talks about basically the business of sports and all these quirky things that I never knew about, like how much people who perform in the Super Bowl get paid and, you know, just, uh, you know, what, what does the Mavericks getting sold mean for the basketball industry? Like, uh, uh, and how do they value the Mavericks and, uh, all, all, or, or, or different salaries. I, I don't know. I haven't, I, he's been on a bunch of times. I've read a bunch of the newsletter. I don't even like sports, but I love reading about right. data in sports and, and business in sports. And so it's these weird intersections that are doing really well on, on Substack, And you can, you can make a lot of money on Substack even with like really offbeat newsletters. Like that's something I would definitely consider. Yeah, no, I, I, I think also just um, my, my work ethic tends to be very inconsistent in that I'm either all in or like I'm lying on a beach for like two months. Yeah. Like I've never been someone who's like, you know, grinded out day in, day out, week in, week out. And I think, you know, if, you, if, you're, if I'm going to be a newsletter person, like the great thing about writing these books and like my weird consulting stuff and speaking is you just kind of like do it when you do it. And then, and then, you know, the rest of the time you kind of just goof around, <laughs> but uh, I, it's I really know. hard. Like I have, I have a hard time with that. Like, like I said, I've been, I've been on this quest where I'm trying to get as good at chess as I was when I was younger. And it's very hard because the whole, I stopped playing for 25 years and the whole world, the whole chess world's different. And so I've been doing my own data analysis. Like um, how often does someone my age get back to their, that level that they once were? It's, it's, right. It, the, it, you could count it on one hand out of oh, is it? Of, yeah, out of really? millions of players. So it's very, very hard. Like, I uh, I was talking to one friend of mine who did a study on this, and it's it's literally like less less than five people. Wow. And uh, uh, but also there's now there, there's things I I look at like okay, what are the most successful opening moves? Like very few people have looked at this before. Like what can I play in the in the beginning of the game? It's called the opening that leads to the highest percentage of wins. And it's funny how few books or players really mention this. And, but there, but there's answers to all well, these I read questions. a book about a, about AI chess and how it's taught people things about the game that we didn't know. Like, I think you, you'll probably know more about like moving the pawn all the way from the end, like up a lot is a very successful move or something. Yeah. You read the book, uh, Game Changers by Matthew. Yeah. Sather. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah that was very it. good book. Yeah. And, that was and, good. Uh, Magnus Carlsen specifically took that book and took those games at the computer played and he really, really studied them and it has right. noticeably improved his game. Like he uses a lot of the computer strategies and he, I mean, it's very hard to improve when you're already the best player in the world. And he was, he's been the best player in the world for about 15 years or more, but he's steadily kept improving, um, because of, because of studying the, the computer and the computer really had like unusual strategies that it had sort of, I guess, perfected and it's, it's worthwhile for humans to, to study them. I, I, I had Gary Kasparov on the podcast and before the podcast we're talking and I asked Gary Kasparov, Hey, I read this great book, Game Changers about, you know, computer chess. And I said, did you read it? And he said, read it. I wrote the forward to it. You didn't read the whole thing. Uh. <laughs> so he's, he's got that, the, the Russian Jew style of <laughs> blunt. Yes. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I do believe that 
if you're really passionately interested in something, there's a way to make money at it. And I, and I just see it in so many different fields. You're right. There is selection bias, but I'm kind of an example of where I've been able to, most things I've been, I've done, I've been able to turn into something that was worthwhile. And now yeah. the other question is, do, at what point do you start thinking about monetization? Because I've also heard, like, if you think too quickly about monetization, like, then you don't allow your creativity and your curiosity to really drive you. But you can't, like, never think about it, right? Yeah, like, like I was writing my kind of personal development type style of blog post for about five or six years before I even thought about monetizing it. And uh, I think, I think yeah, it's it's a good point that the the quicker you monetize something, probably the less money you'll make from it. So you kind of have to let it, because it's sort of like you create this enormous goodwill with your audience uh, when, you, when you're doing something for love and they can see it and, and there's no friction for them to see your stuff because they don't have to pay. And so you build this enormous goodwill and after a certain amount of time, they want to pay you. They want you to benefit from all this good work you're doing. And I'm not saying this in a cynical way, they legitimately, generously want you to do well because you're providing so much value for them. And so they almost feel bad if you don't ask for money at some point. So, that, so you, it's sort of like you'll know the right point to monetize. And I've, I've had a couple of those points depending on what industry I've been because I've also diversified industries, which might be a bad thing because I've been a jack of all trades, master of none, but uh, you know, maybe a little bit of a master in some areas. But... You know, that, that was actually another question. You know, I, I, and this is actually related to your basketball data. I noticed for the seven footers, a lot of them didn't start playing the game until they were older. Whereas probably the six footers played it from the age of six years old on. And I wonder if, you know, in every field, what the ages are where it's too late, given your set of characteristics, at what year is it too late for you to start doing something? Um, and, you know, some professions, it's older than others. I think it's a really good question. I think it's an unknown question. You probably know the book Range, David Epstein. Yeah. Like, everybody loves that book. Yeah. Because uh, it kind of says that, you know, it's good to sample things and take a while to specialize. He starts with sports. He says, you know, Roger Federer. We think of Tiger Woods, who started playing golf when he was two years old. And, like, that's the way to master a sport. But Roger Federer played a whole bunch of sports until he turned to tennis, I think as a teenager. And he actually, that's actually an advantage in some ways uh, in a lot of sports. And like even some seven foot players like Nicole, Nikola Djokic, uh, he played water polo as a kid. And you see the way he plays basketball is like a water polo player. He's just like, oh, he's like looking around, pass this way, pass that way, pass that way. And it's like a really unique, he's kind of, it's kind of has a unique style that turns out to be really effective that he might not have developed if he played basketball too quickly. So probably something like that, but I'm sure it just depends so much on the particular skill that are required, that skills that are required. So like learning a language, we know that the earlier you try, like the better chance you're going to have, like you want to really start, you know, if you have a kid, you want them to be bilingual, you know, raise them as bilinguals, teach them both languages when they're kids. Cause it's going to be way harder when you're uh, 20 or 30 or yeah. let alone 60 to pick up a language. Whereas some other skills like, you know, yeah, like your know, business skill, I think you could probably learn, pretty late, like, you know, uh, almost so the later, the better. Yeah. There, yeah. The, I talked about in my last book that the most successful entrepreneurs tend to be 45 years old, which yeah. surprises people. Everyone thinks it's like 18 year olds, like Zuckerberg, but that's just a selection effect where the best potential entrepreneurs just like start really quickly, like uh, Zuckerberg and Gates and jobs. But you know, the, on average, it's good to like bide your time and learn your, your craft and learn your field and learn your industry and then start your business, you know, in your forties, your fifties, your sixties. So that's an area where it's definitely, I think people think, I guess a lot of people missed opportunities because they thought it was too late, uh, in, in business. Like they're like, you know, they, they had an idea, but they're like 55, they were have a family they have uh, a mortgage. They're like, well, I'm not going to all of a sudden become an entrepreneur. And I think the data clearly shows that's a mistake. Uh, a 60 year old has like a, uh, a higher chance of succeeding than a 20 year old, three times higher chance of succeeding than a 20 year old, like six, six year old still has a great shot of uh, creating a successful business. Uh, so I think that's an area where my guess is a lot of people are missing out by, by thinking it's too late. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Because also uh, look, a 20 year old still doesn't know how to manage risk. And like 90% of entrepreneurship is how you manage risk. Yeah. And 
this is, you know, most companies fail because people don't manage all their risks properly and they don't know how to, how to test things and be cautious and, and so on. But, you know, for you, like you, you love data analysis. Now your third book on, on quirky, weird, fun, exciting data. Uh, and is it monetizable? Probably like, again, I, there's this example from cars. There's tons of examples from every industry, but just specifically what you do, like the quirky stuff, I would try to see if on a regular basis, you could come up with something interesting every week. And it doesn't yeah. have to be the most interesting thing because every, for every newsletter writer, some letters are good, some letters are bad. You know, not every issue is going to be, oh my God, this is the one that's going to go viral. You can't predict virality, but uh, I, I would, you know, like we have a political season coming up. There's certainly lots of data about politics and and so on. I mean, who who who's that guy? Five thirty eight dot com. Nate, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nate uh, whatever. Silver. Yeah, he made a whole career out of like quirky data on politics. Yeah, but yeah. I'm curious if like over the next week or so, you could come up with another quirky thing that you get the data on and you feed it into Code Interpreter and and well, you get I, excited I, about it. Yeah, I think Code Interpreter could make it like really less painful for me too. Cause also I like data analysis, but I've always kind of hated coding. Like coding's never been fun to me. Like that's like boring and like debugging and that's all yeah. annoying. But now I don't have to do any of that. Cause like code interpreter just does it. So now it's just really coming up with the questions. Uh, and and getting the data. Fun. Like where do you get your data from? Well, another reason I did the MBA is there's just so much data available. Like just cause there's so many nerds collecting data on this. So there's all kinds of data sets like Kegel, uh, prediction contests have data sets and basketball reference is this huge site by basketball nerds that they just have tons of information on every player, uh, that was really useful, like all kinds of play. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I have it's a question. Well, yeah. What if every team you like every, every game you bet on the team where on average they have higher, larger hand widths. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wonder if that would be a good betting strategy. Uh, uh, you know, you'd have to figure out, you'd have to take into account the odds, my, I guess. My, yeah, my guess is not, because I think, like, by the time it, an individual game happens, like, we know that's a good player. Like, we know, so Kyrie Leonard is a player with enormous hands, and he outperformed his draft pick. But we knew he was a good player by the time, you know, a certain n number of games into the season. So maybe it'll work, like, the very beginning of the season, but I think eventually... Uh, it would kind of be incorporated into the. But odds. you never know because sometimes there's an arbitrage where the home team, you know, the home team, more people bet on the home team in in that town, and so the line sort of adjusts. I don't know anything really about betting, but you know, sometimes there's an arbitrage because people are excited about a certain team. But what if they play a team where, for whatever reason, this team on average their hands are so much bigger than the team that everyone thinks is going to win. And people aren't aware of this arbitrage. You, there might be opportunities like that. It would definitely be an entertaining way to make money. I would, I would, I would say, uh, just, I, I, would, I think, I think in general betting on sports could be very lucrative. If you, I th didn't you have someone on your show who's made, yeah. who's made a killing yeah. betting on sports, Billy waters. And then I think there was another guy too recently. I forget. I know one guy, Billy waters uh, made a lot of money on sports and he's still making a lot of money on sports doing something like this. And maybe we had someone else recently, but, um, but just even, I don't even care about the betting, like just asking the question, like do the teams with larger hand widths win more than the, the Yeah, no, I, I could have a newsletter where I just ask like a quirky question that only I would think to ask like, yeah. All the Cause time. that's your, that's where you're really, you, you, you're a creative guy and creativity is not just about like painting paintings or right. writing poetry, it's it's these questions and data. So that's why your books, like no one, why did no one ever write a book about uh, using data analysis for self improvement? Like that was a great book. Thank so you. What's the, what was the title of that one again? Don't trust your gut. Don't trust your gut. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, just stuff like that. Like even the stuff like that's in that book. There's so many things that people say on Twitter, like oh, if you take vitamin D, you're never going to get a cold. Like. Every day on Twitter, people are constantly making presumptions and saying things. Well, you could actually test the data on all of these things, write a newsletter that everyone, you know what's going viral already because somebody will say something on Twitter and it'll go viral. And you could just say, oh, well, no, no, that's wrong because here's the data. And then boom, that will go viral, piggybacking on the first thing. Yeah, I also think just for like newsletters, 
It's like, let's say you're charging like a hundred bucks a year. Like I have a pretty big network. Like I, I start with like my mom would definitely subscribe. My dad would subscribe. My brother, my sister. I have like 28 cousins. Like I start, I start doing the math just from there. I'm like, at what point do I just people who love me? I feel like I'm a, I, I have a, I have a lot of friends. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I just get start there. Then I have my base. Then I expand outward to, to fans. I don't know. Here's what you should do. Start it free and get 10,000 free readers and then yeah, yeah. convert to premium. So some of the newsletters, some are still free, like half are free and half are premium. And yeah, yeah. you have to pay like, I don't know, 19 a month or $9 a month for the premium. And, and 10%, roughly 10 to 20% will convert from free to premium. And that's the math. So just, yeah, yeah. you know, get 10,000 subscribers, then you'll have a thousand that'll pay you 10 bucks a month. So that's 10,000 a month. And, but, and to get Go to 10,000 free subscribers is, you know, you have to have not good quality hard. stuff, but it's not like with your material, you'll get that fairly quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess just the, the consistency is something I've always, I've always rebelled against. I don't like yeah. having like pressure to do something every week or whatever. Like I, I like yeah. my two months, like my, I like my little sabbaticals. Like I, like, uh, yeah. So that like I, I bet if I told you, Seth, I want you to come on this podcast every Wednesday and tell yeah, me some new quirky thing. I, I'd shoot myself. Yeah. Probably every I, Tuesday night, you would be like yelling at your girlfriend and, no, I wanna be and the, all this stuff. No, I'm like, I'm, I want to go to the Caribbean for three weeks or something. Like I don't have kids right now. So I'm like, I really can just, uh, I think just, I don't have the thing. I also for a long time have avoided like all things that pin me down in any sort of way. So I think on, on all dimensions of life. And I think this yeah. is another way that's just pit would, would, would feel like a, a, it's pinning me down. It's limiting my, my freedom. I've always been after freedom. So here's what you do. Don't do a newsletter every week. Do first collect like first, let's say two weeks from now you have an inspiration for a newsletter. Okay. Just do it in secret. Then three weeks later you have one. And then suddenly when you have like 20, newsletters done and you haven't and just, released a single one yeah, now yeah. you can start releasing every week knowing you could be consistent because all well, my, the work's done you know do you know ramit sati oh yeah ramit, no, yeah ramit convinced me to do a newsletter in, ramit, tw in 2011 he convinced me to do a newsletter ramit and i lived in the i think we were roommates are for like a semester junior year we were randomly assigned oh wow i'll, I'll give you a great i'll give you a great ramit story I, we were the i think we were roommates maybe dorm mates yeah i think it was roommates and then we uh he announces he's going to teach everyone personal finance. So he starts plastering around the whole dorm, like Ramit Sethi's personal finance class. And, and I'm just like, Ramit, you don't know anything about personal finance. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, nobody's going to show up to your stupid class on personal finance. Like you're not a professor, you know, people have been studying this for 30 years, or whatever. And then he, uh, so he, 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 he puts on his class. I think two people showed up. I think one of them had a big crush on him and I felt so bad. I'm like, this poor guy has no sense of like, what's, what the world wants from him. He's making a fool of himself. Like what a loser. And we, we didn't really talk for a while. And I just like, I'm in my PhD program. I like just wake up one day. I look up, I like, I see Rabit somewhere. I'm like, I look him up. And he's like the world's great personal finance guru. Yeah, he's got, a, and it just he's gets, got a Netflix show. Oh, it gets bigger and bigger. And then he's a number one show and Netflix and this and that. And I'm just like, uh, if I have kids, I'm telling them the Ramit Sethi story. That's how you start. You got to plaster it. You got to have that chutzpah before, you know, fake it till you make it. You got to put, go around, put, put all the stuff on the world. Don't care that your roommate's going to think you're an idiot. You, you know, you're a loser. You're pathetic. You don't know what you're talking yeah. about. He just, he had pure confidence, hustle, chutzpah from day one. And then it, but you, everybody starts, nobody starts like, uh, you know, everyone knows, everyone's super impressed by you. And like, now it's easy for him. Uh, but yeah, but you're, you're totally right. By the way, like you, that's why degrees and experience, it's not like experience is not necessary, but it, it's it's overvalued. You got chutzpah is the most important. Oh yeah, value. Like I well, had a friend. But, but, uh, I just want to tell you the story. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I had a friend who um, he was rejected. He wanted to be a professor of computer science at Cornell University. 
he was rejected. He had a PhD in physics. They didn't want him to teach computer science. So he did the same thing Ramit did. He started putting up signs in Cornell's computer science department at 7 p.m. Thursday night, I'm going to teach this thing about computer science. And he was a good, very talented teacher. More and more people started showing up for a class. Now he's a tenured professor at McGill, like uh, for computer science. And he taught at Cornell for many years. Wow. Yeah, no. But the reason I brought up Ramit is he... I, I'm, I'm, I, I, he apparently now is living a life where it's all automated. A lot of it's automated. He can just go on vacation for like two months and his team or whatever just does all the posts and he, you know, has the posts in waiting and kind of what you're suggesting. And then, so he can live this free life that seems appealing while still, uh, having a massive audience and everything. Yeah. Think about it. Like, let's say for a year you decided to just explore whatever you wanted and you would just format it into a newsletter or even get a virtual assistant to format it into a newsletter when you had enough interesting things. And let's say on average, every two weeks you came up with something. Well, after you have 26 things after 10 years, you have 260. So like at some point there's enough where you could be consistent with a newsletter without really giving you too much stress. Okay. So like that, yeah. that happened, that happens. That still happens for me because I, I wrote every day for like 20 years. So, and a right. lot of things I, I wouldn't publish, some things I would publish, but then people would forget it. So it's possible to just reuse stuff or rewrite stuff all the time because I have thousands and thousands of articles that I have ready to go. Well, so, yeah, and I can also just use stuff for my books. A lot of people wouldn't have read them and then- Yeah, that's... like, like right. Because like on tw you want 100,000 uh, subscribers on Substack. Okay, probably 100,000 people didn't buy your book. I mean, maybe yeah. they did, but you know, you're going to hit a new hundred thousand anyway. And right. of the hundred thousand who read your book, they're going to forget anyway. You know, right. most people forget 95% of what they've read. So, uh, and you could update things. So it doesn't have to be the same. You could give, provide a little bit more insight on, on each thing. So you already have like a ton of material. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so, or you could just, you know, you could slice the material in a different way. So, uh, you know, you, you, you have like a, a an enormous you, you already put a lot of work into this data analysis and you have this very quirky style and this very creative style and data analysis. I would, I would form something around that. Like, it's just a fact. I love that stuff. So I would Thank subscribe you. to your newsletter. So that's Thank why you. I want you to do one. And then Thank you. you could come on this podcast. We'll, we'll talk about all the things I can that promote I'll promote it. your newsletter. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's definitely, I've been thinking a lot of things. I think I, I, I emailed you about a podcast. I'm like, I, I feel like I should be doing, more things. I kind of just got, I also just like, when I get in a situation where things like I, I got in a situation, a couple of my books did well and a combination of consulting and speaking and like some of the book stuff, I was just like making a good living and just like really like, uh, able to take a lot of vacation and stuff. And I was really kind of, uh, phoning it in a bit. And now I'm like, well, maybe I should work harder or do more stuff. We'll see. Yeah. Or, or again, try to try to do more of the stuff you enjoy. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, there's so many different ways to monetize things now. Like I mentioned right. about chess with Twitch, or we had on this couple that they're obsessed with dinosaurs and now they make a living from a YouTube channel about dinosaurs. Or, uh, we had on someone recently who really is good at buying small businesses. So she made a newsletter and, and courses about buying small businesses and she's killing it. So, well, I think actually one newsletter post I'd like to write is analyzing this very question. Cause when you say this, like my data analysis brain is, is skeptical in the sense that I just think you're getting such a selected sample of like the people who succeed in this are the only ones you're seeing. And I just have no idea what the numbers are of someone who goes all in. And I, I would be very interested in seeing that. I believe you're right, but, but two, and there's no way to really know, maybe there is a way to know, and that would be great to find out. But two things have happened though. One is the platforms by which you could monetize knowledge has increased. So it used to be just, let's say books and three television stations. So there were six publishers and three television stations. And that was the only way to monetize something. And it may be infomercials also. And that was it. And this was as recently as like the nineties or the OOs. Now there's like a hundred different platforms and ways to, to monetize things. So, so that number has increased. And then I just see from the inside, like in the chess world, people I knew who 
were not good players, but for years had like good, decent YouTube channels and they just loved it. Now they're actually like making a living and they will for the rest of their lives because they have the right number of subscribers. And I just saw that happen internally. And so I know people who tried and failed, but they also didn't really try hard enough. So again, I, I, I don't know what tr trying and failing means. Sometimes right. you try and you're not that good at it and you don't enjoy it. So you don't, and you don't like having a small audience for a while. So you give up. So it, it's hard to say, it's hard to really get data on that. But I saw how that industry grew from the ground up. I do agree with you that, you know, persistence goes a long way. If you go out, you know, people I know who are painters and they, you know, they were broke until their like late thirties, like making no money, and, but kept at it, kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. And then they get their big break. It's a combination of you got to just keep putting work into the world to allow your break to, you know, allow the break to happen. And then once you get that break, you got to just like capitalize on it like crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I think if you're willing to do that, the odds are probably are pretty good, even on something as seemingly long shot as like, uh, paint, like a painter. Although I think there are some things where it's just like the odds are just too far against you, like being an actor, or actress in Hollywood or something like that. But I think like you could do, be really persistent and, you know, keep going for it and do everything right. And I just think the odds are just so low that. Yeah, I think that's right. But you know, also you have to be able to withstand backlash. So when, whenever you monetize something, some people are going to hate you for it. Some people who loved you, quote unquote, are now going to hate you no matter what. As soon as you turn on every switch to make money or any switch to make money, some people will hate that you did that. Like if you take, if you didn't have ads on your podcast and now you have ads, there will be a, a, a group of people who will hate you because now you have ads. If you never were charging for something and now you're charging for something, there's a group of people who will hate you and say you sold out and you feel really bad that these people hate you because you thought they loved you, but you confuse their love for real love. And I'm just, I'm more talking to myself that I was always very disappointed at the people who would be disappointed in me whenever I charged for something and I felt guilty about it. But over time you, you, you deal with it. I do think in general, like as a creative person, you have to be really, you have to like almost lean into to the haters. You got to kind of get off on, on the haters, Yeah, uh, which becomes e e like, I remember like uh, my first book came out and you know, everyone loved it. Everyone's like, this is great. It's great. Great. Second book. Like, yeah, again, some people are expecting it to be like my first book. So then they're just like, you know, I got attacked. And initially I was like, I like, I don't know how I'm going to deal with a bad review, but then like, you just kind of lean into it and you're like, it's kind of funny that they like, what they attack you for too. And you're just like, you start laughing it off and then like that kind of energizes you. And you're like, well, now I don't care. Cause I can handle like someone, like one person just said that I'm like the most self-absorbed person they've ever seen or something. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I get I, to be fair. I am probably pretty close. I am. I, I can be pretty self-absorbed. So it, it, they did kind of nail me. So I'm like, I just thought it was kind of funny, like that they thought that. And like, particularly when you get someone who, like a bad review from someone who's like, very like by the book and like, uh, you know, plays by the rules and more like, you know, presentable and official and stuff. And they like hammer you. Then I kind of get off on that. Like, you know, I feel like it's kind of cool. That, that I don't that's really a good attribute. That. Like, yeah, I, I used to think I didn't care, but you know, I've been doing this, you know, I've been writing or doing things for the public or either podcasts or going on TV or writing since about 2002, maybe even a little earlier. So 20 over 20 years. And every time there's a, 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 a backlash, it gets more and more heightened. So at first, if just one person wrote me and said, oh, you, you know, you ugly Jew, what, what's up? Like I would get offended. That was like in 2003, then that stopped offending me. But then it, it just gets the, the hate, the trolls or haters keep upping the ante every few years. And at some point they find your buttons. And, and it, it, it does get a little painful. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting what your button is. So like, you know, you know, if someone says like my teeth are yellow or yeah, you're ugly or whatever. I'm just like, yeah, okay, fine. Like I'll, I'll care. Like it doesn't really bother me, but like if they have, uh, like if, if they, if they say like, he's a pretty good data analyst or something like that, <laughs> that would just like drive me insane. Like that pretty uh, good. Yeah. No, I, I, so somebody told me, I don't know if this is true, that I think it was like Chevy Chase 
punched like Steve Martin in the face or something. They were getting this huge fight and someone said, what happened? And it was that uh, Chevy Chase had, uh, Steve Martin had said to Chevy Chase that he's a pretty good comedian. <laughs> Yeah, and like you're you're pretty good. You're you're a pretty good comedian. And like if he had said you're the worst comedian I've ever heard, you'd be like, oh, he's just in a bad mood or he's just jealous or whatever. But like pretty good is like fuck. He like looked at me closely and concluded <laughs> that I was pretty good. And that that kind of like uh, can uh, I, I think I can relate to that. Like if that that I think, would I think hurt, that was hurt me the, more than someone really attacked me. I think that was on the set of SNL when that happened. Was and it? Yeah. I'm not sure if it was Steve Martin. It might have been Bill Murray. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. But, I, uh, I forget, like all, all those guys had big personalities. Um, but uh, yeah, and similarly, I got a review on one of my books. It was one out of five stars. And they're like, this is the most unintentionally like hilarious book of the year. And like, it reads like a set, like a parody of a TED talk or something. And like, that didn't bother me at all. If it was like three stars or four stars, like that would have really yeah, driven me. Three stars me are the mad. worst. Yeah, like. Yeah, it's pretty good. You know, not quite at the level of an Adam Grant or like this or that, but like the worst book I've ever read. I'm just like, yeah, that's kind of fun. Like that didn't bother me at all. It'd be interesting to study what makes the Adam Grants of the world. <laughs> Cause I feel like there are some writers who have this very sort of narrative, but academic style that do get blessed by the media and become larger than life when, okay, I love Adam Grant's stuff and he's been on this podcast a billion times. But I'm just curious, like Adam Grant, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, uh, some other people, all their stuff's good, but just, there's also a lot of good stuff out there that never gets noticed. Uh, I'm just curious what makes the difference. Is it the academic credentials? I think is Adam, it... I think Adam, well, Malcolm Gladwell doesn't have ac academic credentials. That's I think true, yeah. Adam, Adam Grant has a combination of a real talent. I think he's, his storytelling is great. And I yeah. think he's really, really hardworking. Yeah. Like he is, you talk about cons like the consistency that I struggle with, like he's tweeting and you know, he has a new, new thing every day, like so consistent. It's, it's hard to keep ethic. that up though. Like I can't, yeah. I did that for 20 years and I just can't do it anymore. I'm too old. Yeah. Yeah. I think he has, he, he's got a real talent. I think he's just got incredible, uh, work ethic and discipline and consistency. And then, uh, yeah, there is something probably like, he is uh, presentable to like the world in some way that people like or something. Like, I think that's where you're getting at. Like yeah. that he's blessed. Like that uh, pe people are happy for him to be like a, the next Malcolm Gladwell or something in a way that some other people wouldn't get that same blessing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Lot, see, lots of interesting data out there. <laughs> that's uh, for sure. So, so Seth, I, always love talking to you. I'm actually experiencing severe COVID related pain at the moment. And so I think I have to go, unfortunately, but come on, seriously, come on the podcast. Anytime you find out any interesting data at all, no pressure, <laughs> no stress. We don't even have to schedule. You could just call us up and you can come on the next day yeah, yeah. and, uh, uh, happy to have you on anytime and always interesting stuff. And meanwhile, uh, what's it? Why NBA players get picked? Is that Wait, who makes no? Who makes the NBA? Oh, who makes the NBA? Yeah. Uh, it was such a fun read because I like I like having these questions answered, and and you don't you don't realize you like having them answered until you read what the questions are. Like, let me actually was your list of questions. Well, I'm going to read the list of questions in the when I do the intro that you mentioned in your intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Great book once again, and, and, and thanks again for coming on the podcast. Always fun, James. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Seth. Your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the Snapdragon processor powering the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion. Whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge-of-your-seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra-realistic graphics, and adrenaline-boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official. Diving deep into your passions has never been easier. Thanks to Amazon Prime. You get all-in-one access to the things you need so you can get more out of the things you love. 
with a range of services including Prime Video, Amazon Music, and Prime Fast free shipping. Amazon Prime is like your personal mission control for all the things that inspire. From shopping and streaming to saving, it's on Prime. Visit Amazon.com slash Prime to get more out of whatever you're into. It's on Prime.